I am just delighted to see all of you all here. I'm the director of the Washington County Library System, and it is just so nice to have people to come out on Saturday as well as our usual Sunday get-togethers. Before we get into this program, though, I want to remind you about what will be going on a week from tomorrow. We will have another one of our Sunday with Friends, Sunday with Friends programs. This one will be celebrating poetry, and we will have Sophia Starnes, who is a Virginia Poet Laureate, um, will be here reading some of her poetry, and she'll be joined by people from the Virginia or the Appalachian Poet and Writers Group. You all bear with me. I am like the pro public service announcement person today, and I have a lot of stuff. So if I mess it up, just ignore it. Okay. Um, we're really glad to have this relationship with Barter Theater. Um, Barter is just so good to us, and of course they serve the entire region, but we are the library system that benefits so much from that partnership. Um, Barter sought us out for this particular arrangement that we're doing here today. Other years we've worked with them on some book discussion groups, but it was Barter that came to us and said we have um, some events coming up that we would like to partner with. And for us, Rick Rosen and I have talked about this, other people in Barter, we've all talked about this a lot. The library in Barter have a, a very similar um, mission. We share a lot of the same goals and a lot of the same values. And we're here to educate people, we're here to entertain people. And by exposing people, either by going to plays or by reading, people, the more they're exposed to different things, the more they're encouraged to think about a world or existence beyond just where they are. And when you do that, you know, your whole community prospers, your whole civilization becomes more enriched. And we are truly enriched by the partnership that we have with Barter and the things that we're able to do with the community. Now I have something that is a new activity for us to explain to you. In your chair, you have these little books. And it's, it's so good when the staff comes up with ideas and, and plans something, but then if you're the one that's introducing it, sometimes you don't get it all right. Uh, but what we have this called a playbook, and inside there's a place that you can put your name and then there's three little blocks. Now, most of yours today should already have a little star in it. And what you do with this book is you hang on to it, put your name in it, and every time that you go to a pro or an activity that's related to something that Barter is doing, or you read a book that one of the Barter Place this season is based on, you get a stamp on here. So today, you're stamped already because you've come to an event that's related to the barter. If you go to the play tonight, bring your ticket stub back, and we will stamp it. The box office can't deal with all that stamping, so bring your ticket stub back here, and we will do that. If you pick up some of um, the books that are going to be um, featured in some of the plays, uh, this season, then show those to the circulation staff and they will stamp, uh, stamp this book. When you get three of these, you put it in a box and then we will have a drawing every so often and give away two free tickets to the barter. So that's a nice thing. And there's going to be a lot of activities coming up. You know, we have uh, Little Women will be coming up soon. Um, several other plays that are based on well-known books. And we will have book discussion groups throughout uh, the barter season. We're going to have some people come in and do lectures, planning some activities with children related to some of, uh, of the books. So there'll just be lots of things that we'll be announcing as we get closer to that time. There's still an, another thing partnership with Barter that is just wonderful. If you go to Barter with your library card and you just show them that library card, you will get $5 off on the ticket price of walking across Egypt. Now that wouldn't apply if you've got those patron passes or something like that, but any other type of ticket that you would be purchasing, Barter is going to give you a discount by having that library card. And if, by some wild chance, that you do not have a Washington County library card, <laughs> you, got more left? you can get one today 
we will be open until 7 o'clock. If you are not a resident of Washington County, if you can come up with something like, I come here and I work here, I do some, you know, we're easy. Uh, <laughs> We will find you, though, if wherever you live, if you don't bring your books back. But, uh, but you can get a card here without proving a lot of, of information about your residency. Um, there's one other thing. I told you it's public service announcements. When we do planning, it's really good for us to know what people think, what they like, what suggestions that they may have. And it's really good if somebody puts these wonderful little blurbs in here that we can cut and paste and, and plug into a grant proposal or use in some type of PR. So we have these survey forms, and we encourage you to complete a survey form. When you finish them, you can put them over there on, on the table. We have pencils over there. You can also give us your email address and we will add it to an email list that we have and when something special comes up, like this whole event was you know, pretty short notice, we send out email blasts to let you know what's coming up, uh, you know, special events that will be coming up. So this will help us with planning, it will help you stay informed about what's going on for the library. And that's all the things I have to tell you about. Again, thank you for coming and now you will hear from Amanda Leslie that works at Barter and has been our partner in making these arrangements. Proud and pleased to be partnering. Um, I did want to say the box office is not going to ask you about your overdue fines, so you can still use it, but you should pay those. You just go ahead and do it. Um, I am so thrilled and pleased to be able to announce Clyde Edgerton. Um, I've been a huge fan of Southern writing for a long, long time, and his work has such an amazingly distinct uh, voice. In fact, I found a wonderful quote from Barbara Kingsolver from the New York Times Book Review. So perfect is his control that each voice, like an individual bell in a handbell choir, rings true. Mr. Edgerton's gift is for dialect that places its speaker squarely, not only on a geographical map, but a psychological one. Uh, I love that quote, and uh, I think that many of you who've read his books find that to be true as well. Um, Clyde Edgerton was raised in uh, Bethesda, North Carolina, right outside of Durham. He's published nine novels and a memoir. Uh, the Bible Salesman, his ninth novel, was published by Little Brown in 2008. Three of his novels have been made into movies, and six have been made into stage adaptations, including Walking Across Egypt at Barter, which is actually a new stage adaptation by Catherine Bush, our playwright in residence. Um, I hope you've all got your tickets already. I won't say any more about that. Uh, it's a wonderful, wonderful play. Uh, Edgerton's short stories and essays have been published in the New York Times Magazine, Best American Short Stories, Southern Review, and other publications. He's actually also an accomplished musician, and he has... Uh, performed with musicians including Jim Watson and Mike Craver and uh, record studio albums, which you can check out on uh, the internet and his website. Um, among his many awards are the Lindhurst Prize, honorary doctorates from UNC Asheville and St. Andrews Presbyterian College, membership in the Fellowship of Southern Writers, North Carolina Award for Literature, and five notable book awards from the New York Times. He's a professor of creative writing at UNC in Wilmington, and he lives there in Wilmington with his wife and Christina and their children. So uh, without further ado, I'd like to introduce Clyde Edgerton. The book, Lunch at the Piccadilly, which was published in... 2003 has been made into a play and we're trying to get it up and running. It's a musical and I would love for it to be here someday. I want to tell you a word or two about that, say a word or two about that particular play, the background of the novel, and then talk a little about uh, Walking Across Egypt. In 1996, my aunt went into a nursing home. I was her sole caretaker. Uh, some of you have been through this experience in one way or another and know that when an older relative has to, to go into a nursing home and you are responsible, there's a lot of stress involved. Um, my aunt went into the nursing home when I was a full-time writer, so I didn't have a day job. I could go by and see her at any time. I'd go by 11.30 in the morning, 3.30 in the afternoon, and one Thursday afternoon, I was clipping her toenails for her, and she looked over and her roommate, whose name was Ernestine, and she said, 
Don't you wish you had a nephew that come and do for you like this one does for me? <laughs> and Ernestine said, I've got two nephews. They both work. <laughs> somewhere. <laughs> Too good not to pass up. So then as I came to the nursing home uh, and visited her, I began to realize the, the stress, the, the, the courage, the pain, the loss that was involved with families in nursing home, homes. And I decided I had to write a novel about a nursing home, even though there may be uh, some ways it seemed a little bit cliche, but, I, but it wasn't. It was important. And, and but my friends who found out I was writing about a nursing home started telling me nursing home stories, some of which were more or less appropriate. Uh, <laughs> I did not want to start making fun of a group to which I'm slowly becoming a member of. <laughs> and uh, yet on the other hand, my mother and her sisters, uh, who I spent a lot of time with growing up, they were all around 40 years older than, than I was, but it was like being with three grandmothers. I, I knew there was a lot of humor in my family, and I knew that, that I could deal with and would have to deal with. There's no choice but not to be to deal with humor in this book. So uh, one of the stories, some of the stories, that nursing home stories, were not appropriate for my book. Um, and, but one was, and I want to share that with you. Um, it's supposed to be a true story. It was told to me as if it were a true story. Apparently, uh, Billy Graham was in the lobby of a nursing home, and an elderly woman was sitting there, uh, a person who was a resident, and he talked to her for about 20 minutes, and finally he said, Do you know who I am? And she said, No, but there's a nurse down at the end of the hall that can tell you who you are. <laughs> That stage where uh, I become forgetful once in a while, sort of like the the uh, grandmother of Jill McCorkle who told me this story. Her nephew, the grandmother's nephew, was riding along with her in the car, and the grandmother was driving, and she ran up on the curb, straight out, drove, drove along a little further, ran up on the curb again, and the nephew said, "Grandma, why do you keep running up on the curb?" And she said, "Oh, am I driving?" <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, so these stories uh, can be more or less funny. I mean, I guess if you're driving, it might be funny. One that's not so funny that I just had a chance to use driving up here with my wife. What did she ask me? She asked me something, but the answer was the same answer. Again, I get a lot of stories from Jill, and, and this is, it was, it's not really all that funny, but it's, it's a good answer. Her grandmother was watching TV with an arm over her, just sitting there with an arm up like this, watching TV. And Jill said, Grandma, why are you watching TV with your arm over your head? And her, her grandma said, I don't know, what do you think? Christina <laughs> <laughs> asked me something when we were driving up in the car, and I said, I don't know, what do you think? <laughs> now, walking across Egypt came about as a consequence of a story my mother told me, and I guess this was um, probably, I don't know, it, must, it had to have been uh, the mid-80s or early 80s. Uh, I, I would go by, my mother would, hey, Kathy. Would, <laughs> hey, Katie. Would, uh, we're right at home here. <laughs> we, uh, would tell me, uh, now I, I feel like I need to go back and tell you these stories. They were the best ones I had, and I'm on, but I'll tell you work, later. Work, work, work. Yeah. Uh, so we're talking about walking across Egypt now. Okay. My, uh, uh, Kathy adapted walking across Egypt. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. and Katie basically runs the barter. Right. <laughs> um, Eugene, wave. The director of Egypt. Hey, what we need to oh, and the director. Yeah. Right. Nice to meet you. So 
I came home, and uh, I guess it was a Sunday afternoon, and there were several relatives sitting around, and my mother said, I want to tell y'all something. She said, I hadn't planned to tell anybody this, but um, yesterday, I guess this is, this is not giving away too much. This is not most of the credit. Yesterday, I backed up and sat down in that chair over there, and it didn't have a bottom in it. And she said, I went right on down about that far from the floor, and my arms were straight up, my legs were straight up. She said, all I could do was move my head a little bit and rock back and forth. And she said, I wasn't hurt, and she went on to tell how she got out. Well, by the time she finished telling the story, I was in the floor. Uh, it was so funny, so I said, I've got to write about it. And um, then I had to come up with some kind of context, and it's true that she uh, did have a little... Uh, there was a little stray dog that had been coming up to the back door, and she would complain to me about the, the dog hanging around. That little dog keeps hanging around back. I said, well, Mom, you feed him, aren't you? She said, well, yeah, and he wouldn't get anything to eat if I did. And I said, well, he's not going to go anywhere as long as you feed him. <laughs> and we'd go back and forth, back and forth. And, uh, oh, that just reminded me of one that's something that's not in the play I need to talk about, so I'll completely spoil the play for the playwright and the director who are here. Uh, my mother one time told me about the same time, and this ended up in the book, she said, you know, uh, Om and Lyle, those were sisters, she said, we're going up to the funeral home next week. I said, why? She said, to get on the plan. <laughs> I said, to get on the plan. She said, yes, you can go up and, and get everything all arranged beforehand, and you won't have to worry about it or bother anybody later. And I said, well, that's, that's, that's great. So the next week I came back, I said, y'all... Go to the funeral. Yes, we did. It was very nice. We uh, we got had coffee and cake served to us, and we looked around and on and on. And I said, "Well, that's good." She said, "We're going back in two weeks." <laughs> I said, "Going back in two weeks? Why?" She said, "Well, they were out of the stainless steel." <laughs> so we're going back to look at the stainless steel. I said, "Wow." <laughs> That's wonderful. And uh, as a matter of fact, I might as well keep this going since it's all coming in my head. Uh, after my mother died, uh, right when she, uh, two days or day, the day she died, the day after, I was lucky in that I had a cousin named Ola who lived with my mother, who stayed with my mother, had been. My mother at age uh, uh, 94 was living alone. She fell and one thing led to another, as you know, and my cousin was living with her. And my cousin uh, was was probably in her late 70s, um, Ola. Ola, I said, Ola, I can't go up to that funeral home by myself. You're going to have to go with me. So we got up there, and we're sitting down. The funeral home director comes in, and we're talking, and he says, you know, we're out of the <laughs> stainless steel that your mother ordered and uh, let me show you what we have and I said Ola come with me so she, we went back in the room and he said now here's one blah 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 and, blah. and Ola who uh, it, in my family there is a tradition of saying words that aren't the way they're supposed to be <laughs> Sam I had, a, I had a cousin who would it's rather than miracle, she, she called the word miracle, mackerel. She said, it was just a mackerel that they picked up. <laughs> so this is kind of goes in the family. So Ola pulled me over, and she said, after he just showed us one, and she pulled me over, she said, don't get that one. I said, why? She said, it's too gawky. <laughs> back on script. Uh, so about the same time, my mother, uh, my cousin, I heard of a cousin whom I had never met, uh, a young man who was 16. I did know his grandmother who was in the family, and I knew her quite well. Uh, I called her Aunt Hortense, and Aunt Hortense had been locked out of the bathroom by this, by this kid, a uh, 16-year-old grandson, and I, I heard about that, and, and I, that's all I needed. Uh, for some kind of something. And about that time, uh, a friend of mine named Lex Matthews, who was an Episcopal priest, he would got me into all kinds of trouble by volunteering me to do this and that. I'd find myself in places I didn't know, I couldn't figure out why I was there because of Lex, but Lex had this philosophy, and as much as you've done it to the least of these, my brothers, you've done it also to me. And so he, he, he had me uh, helping people. 
the least of these in all sorts of ways. And so I, I was thinking that Lex was on my mind, and uh, I put several things together and came up with this idea about a, a woman having to make a decision. And so that's uh, where the uh, where the idea of the novel came from, and I started writing, and I was very lucky. Most of the time I spend uh, two to three years uh, on a novel, or four from the time it's conceived. The longest has been um, about ten years to, to write a book while I was writing a couple others. But I, I, I could see this whole story in my head, and I decided I would work every morning. I would write seven pages a day on a longhand and a legal pad, and it took me seven weeks I had a first draft, which was just impossible, uh, and, it, and it won't happen again, but that was the first draft, and then I reworked that draft for about nine months, and uh, finally I had a draft, and, and I was lucky that I just had a book published with Algonquin Books, and so they published Walking Across Egypt. And uh, I also feel very fortunate that Kathy came along and asked me if she could uh, adapt it to stage, and she has, and I'm looking forward to seeing it tonight. And what I'll do is, uh, in the, I will say this, when I finished the book, uh, I did not have a title. I, I had two working titles, and I didn't like either one of them. One was Slowing Down, and the other one was Shall We Gather at the River. And, and I didn't have great reasons for using those titles. So I started doing what I usually do when I look for a title, the first advice that I give people if they can't find a title is go to the last third of the book or the last third of the story and start reading backwards looking for a phrase that will, will somehow sum up things, perhaps. Uh, that didn't work. I went to old hymns and started looking there. I went to uh, um, the Bible, Ecclesiastes is a great place to look for titles. Uh, uh, Sun Also Rises, I think, comes from there, and a bunch of others. Uh, somebody here probably knows more than I do about that. The librarian, I'm sure, could give us some titles. And then I, I found a book called The Golden Bough, which some of you may or may not know of a gentleman named Fraser, and I started reading through that, and I, and I saw Walking Across Egypt in a sentence. I haven't been able to find it since. I, I, I looked briefly, but I saw Walking Across Egypt, I thought, wow, that would be... That would be interesting. I had heard my Aunt Alma use that term, walking across Egypt, and, and, and the way she used it was, it's a teeny bit off color, but we don't have any small children here. It's not even that much <laughs> off color. My Aunt Alma, among the three, the three sisters, uh, again, they, my mother was 40, and she had slightly older and slightly under sister. They had no children. My, I was the only child, so I had these three grandmothers I followed around and listened to all the time, and one of them, Aunt Alma, was always going to the bathroom. <laughs> and my mother never went to the bathroom. And Alma used to say, Truman could walk across Egypt before she had to pee. <laughs> I said, okay, I'm going to try to uh, name this book Walking Across Egypt, but I have no reason to name it Walking Across Egypt. So I thought, okay, if there were a song, if there was something she were looking for throughout the book, and at the end, she found it, or almost found it. That would give me an excuse to call the book that. She's looking for something. And there, it is kind of a journey, kind of a search, kind of a making a decision. So I said, I'm going to write that in. So I went back, and I went through my draft, and I wrote in her thinking about or looking for a song called Walking Across Egypt. And when I finished that, I said, that's not, the punch is not quite there. I, I need to go ahead and write the song. So I started looking at old hymns uh, from the turn of the century and around that time, and I tried to get the feel of, 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 an, of an old song, an old gospel tune. And so I came up with the words, I wrote them out, and uh, my cousin arranges music, and I asked her, I said, would you put this in the hymn, uh, hymn format, and we can just stick it in the very back of the book. We can have her looking for it and maybe not quite find it, and then the reader gets to the VN and turns the page, maybe, and there's the hymn. And that'll work, and that's a, that's a good idea for helping me call it Walking Across Egypt. So that's where the title uh, came from, and I'll try to sing it, a verse of it. Walking across Egypt, no shelter from the sun. My journey has no stopping place, my journey's far from done. Walking with Jesus, I shall not stop to rest. My face is set, is set before me, and my journey shall be blessed. I'm walking, walking, 
Walking, walking, walking across Egypt, walking, walking across Egypt, my heart shall see the way, my stride shall not be broken, there will be no delay, walking with Jesus to the brightest day. <laughs> Now, uh, what I have now, what I'd like to do is read a little bit from a book that's coming up. I've got one other, one other old, old story. Uh, Ola, <laughs> Ola, in fact, uh, Ola, when I found Ola, when my, my mother, was, mother was in a nursing home, but she could come home, and I, I wanted someone to stay with her. And so I called the nursing home social worker, and I said, when you have a resident that comes in with a caretaker, and the resident is probably not going to leave the nursing home, and the caretaker needs work, would you let me know? And she did, and I, a couple of weeks later, I met this woman named Ola King, and we started talking, and I realized I had kings on both sides of the family. And so I said, do you know, and we started trading off names, you all know how that is, and found out that she was a cousin of mine on both sides of my family. My father's <laughs> side, the kings on my daddy's side, and the kings on my mama's side. And she, both of her husbands had been kings, unrelated, and uh, had, they had both died, and she wore two wedding diamonds on her, on her hand, which I always haven't used that yet. And I got it, but that's three years, you can't use it. <laughs> After three years, it's yours. So, uh, oh, I also, that reminds me, I, I, I uh, wow, I had a guy who tried to get me to buy his business, a septic tank business, cleaning septic tank, and he was in my house, and he was showing me, I said, well, let me see, and he was showing me all about roots, and blah, 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 he said, it's amazing what you find in these things. <laughs> he said, my wife's got diamond rings on both hands. <laughs> And so I go by there all the time to eat lunch with Mama and Ola. And one day, Ola cleaned her plate as usual. She looked at me. She said, "You know, when I was growing up, we have. Where did I know you from?" <laughs> the writer's workshop. Okay, it's good to see you. Again. <laughs> so I just saw this face that I knew. So Ola says, uh, "You know what? When I was growing up, we were made to clean our plate." or we were made to feed, feel bad. She said, I guess I'm just fat from shame. <laughs> um, now, the book that I'm going I'm to read you a little bit from, from, from this book, I have it on my computer before the power runs out, I keep talking. And I wrote this book as a consequence of uh, my days as a father, it's probably surprising to those of you who don't know that I have a, a 30 year, it's not surprising that I have a 30 year old, but it is surprising that I have a 9 year old, a 6 year old, and a 7 year old. And so I stay busy and uh, observe. Um, so some of you have had experience, either as grandparents or as all of any parents had experience with children, I hope, but if you're a grandparent, you've experienced some of what I'm going to read about. So I'll read through uh, just a little bit from different sections of this book called Papa Daddy's Book for New Fathers. It's for fathers only, but it's okay. We have some non-fathers here, and you can listen in. <laughs> Car seat. A few weeks before the baby is born, go ahead and install the car seat. This could take one to seven days. <laughs> <laughs> For safe installation, certain hooks are located out of sight down in the car seat crack where you'd slide your hand if you were looking for something lost. If your car doesn't have these hooks, you are required by law to buy a different car. <laughs> One of your cousins or a brother or sister-in-law will eventually inspect the installation of the seat and will get very upset because it's too loose or not hooked up right, and they will call the authorities. <laughs> This relative will be a vegetarian. <laughs> when I wrote that down, this was on the, about the third or fourth or fifth draft, I wrote this relative will be a vegetarian. I had no idea why I 
why I wrote it, and the first time I read it, I got the same reaction. <laughs> and I tried to figure out why it's so funny, and the only reason I can figure out why it's so funny is because it's true. <laughs> Yes, it is. Not for any of the vegetarians who might be here, but the ones back home. Another idea is to get a neighbor father who now has a baby to install your car seat under a bartering system. In exchange, consider offering to remodel his kitchen. <laughs> Children cannot sit in the front seat of an automobile until age 24. <laughs> Else the front seat airbag will kill them. If the front airbag happens not to kill them, then the side airbag will try to. <laughs> Correction, after they're 18, they can sit in the front seat if they face backwards. <laughs> if you decide to get your car seat installed at a fire station, a firefighter will give you a fire lecture. He will show you how to grab your baby and roll on it if it catches fire. <laughs> a nurse will be on hand to tell you how to resuscitate a smothered baby. After the lecture, you're required to buy chain ladders to hang from each window of your house. First floor included. The proceeds will go to the local police benevolent organization, and if you write down the wrong phone number, they'll stop trying to call you. <laughs> After the car seat, we have in-laws. <coughs> If they are dead, your in-laws will probably not interfere with your fathering. <laughs> but they may. <laughs> Family norms tend to stay around for several generations. Things like whether or not presents inside Christmas stockings are wrapped, whether or not shoes should be worn in the house, whether or not baby can stay up late at night or watch television only one hour a day. In other words, even if your in-laws have passed on or live in Nova Scotia, they may <laughs> still whisper into your wife's ear. <laughs> then we've got your wife. We've got a section on non-traditional arrangements. We've got a section on pets, letters to baby. Then B, not long after birth, advice from books, the fatherhood culture, and then childproofing. I'll read from childproofing a little bit. <coughs> Childproofing homes started up after our species began using electricity and poison and glass to make the world an easier, prettier, and safer place to live in. <laughs> you will have no time to childproof the house, trust me, between the time the baby is born and then gets old enough to aim and spray paint remover into its mouth. <laughs> Here are some pointers. Number one, use insertable covers over electrical outlets. These look like plastic electric plugs that fit right up against the outlet cover. The idea is that babies will be unable to stick a fork in the outlet and shock themselves. Here's the deal. These insertable covers fit so tight against the outlet you can't get them out. But the baby can. <laughs> idea is to back a refrigerator up against each electrical outlet in your house. Bassinet and crib. For the first few months before using the crib, you'll be using a bassinet. I'm suggesting, I'm suggesting you keep this in your in your wife's bedroom, assuming you use the same bedroom. Some experts declare that the baby should sleep with you, some say in another room. If you do go with the bassinet idea, most people buy expensive white wicker, wicker ones with little handles and a satin pillow and all that, or they inherit one. Caleb and Cindy, those are cousins in this narrative, realize that a little baby can't have C and could care less, so why not use an ice cooler <laughs> with the top thrown away. Not the styrofoam kind, the hard kind, like a Coleman. Then we go for preparing for the day of birth, part two, baby arrival, and follow up. We've got the birth, home birth, your roll to the hospital, normal delivery, C-section. I think on the C-section part, I said, if, if if you were ever in a Civil War medical tent and enjoyed it, then be at the C-section. Seeing the baby, you and the baby, nurses, 
circumcision, remember this is fathers only, back home, the drive home. <coughs> On the drive home from the hospital, you will experience an odd combination of two feelings. Experience an odd combination of two feelings. A, extreme ecstasy. B, deep worry about how the baby will keep breathing all night on that first night home and how to keep, say, large rats away from it. <laughs> Note, rats have a hell of an easier time eating through wicker than through a cooler. <laughs> Crying and sleep problems, TV, safe sleep, mama crying, neighbors who visit, poop, pee, wipes, and diapers. I remember in some place in this book, I say to the fathers who I hope are reading it, uh, I, I say something. You, you may think now that there's too much poop, pee, and diapers uh, in this book. I said, after a while, you won't. <laughs> now, uh, this is called, this section is, I believe, uh, night feeding duties. If your wife is breastfeeding, you should share night feeding duties with her. That means when the baby starts crying just as you're falling to sleep, you pick the baby up from the cooler at the foot of the bed, <laughs> bring it to your wife's side. Some book will have instructed you to always keep tab of which breast she used last <laughs> by noting L for left and R for right in a small notebook. <laughs> but the best way is to sort of juggle both breasts to see which one is heavier. <laughs> this will normally wake her up. <laughs> But if she won't wake up, whisper that you want to make love, and she will try to escape. Thus making up. <laughs> Unbutton her pajamas and prepare the baby for the appropriate breast. The hungry baby's head will bob and jerk around while it looks cross-eyed for anything that resembles a nipple. You should keep it away from the bedside radio because it will suck the knobs off of it. <laughs> so then we have section C, settling in, spoiling, scheduling, charting, talking toys. Satan is, Satan is real, and these are among his gifts, talking toys, in my view. <laughs> one night, this is in here somewhere in the book, but it just popped my head. One night, I, I, for about six nights in a row, I'd turn off the, the light in the little playroom we had next to the back porch, and when I turned out the light, I'd hear this, Good night! <laughs> Screech! Good night! So I went, started going through all the toys looking for this thing. And I cut out the light and I said, Good night! I put the light back on it. I couldn't find it. And finally I found it. It was a little plastic man. The first chance I got, I put it under the back tire behind the car and it backed over. I just heard the part scattering everywhere and it felt so good but I wouldn't have been surprised if it had to get back. <laughs> Those things drive me crazy. Okay, talking to a sleep problems, yours, playing with baby, reading to baby, cursing in front of baby, <laughs> chores, stuff your children will say to each other and to you and what you might say back sometimes, what you do and say that they'll remember, games, toys, other games, and then later on Preparations. Now, here's the last one I'll read. It's of the miscellaneous section. It's called Head Lice. <laughs> when you answer a call on your cell phone from a teacher or counselor or your wife, um, saying that your child has head lice, the conversation will start like this. Are you sitting down? <laughs> and then, after they tell you your child has lice, you will wonder what the big deal is. And you'll wonder again when you see your child and she and her hair look all normal. Your wife will hand you a sheet of paper from the school with a letter on one side and advice on the other. She will then leave for her uncle's home in Tampa, Florida. <laughs> <laughs> the advice on the back of the letter will seem too troublesome to follow, so you'll find and follow a less troublesome set of instructions on the web. 
This advice will have you washing all the clothes, furniture, bed linen, and books in your home twice. This less troublesome set of instructions will also ask you to vacuum your yard and the roof of your home as well as the inside of your toilet. <laughs> After three days and your child still has lice, you will follow the more troublesome <laughs> advice found on the internet and in letters from your school and church's daycare facility. When that advice doesn't work and you find that lice have spread to a second child, consider the following. Number one, burn down your home <laughs> and move into another that's at least six miles away. <laughs> Number two, since your child will have run back into the burning house and saved each of her 200 individually named stuffed animals, you will have to wash each one of those <laughs> separately twice in lye soap and rubbing alcohol and then shrink wrap them and store them in sealed plastic bags in a large rented freezer for two years. <laughs> Shrink wrap the freezer. <laughs> Number three, buy 50 gallons of vinegar. This will be cheaper than many products sold for lice removal. White vinegar, vinegar is preferred, but any will do as long as it has 5% acidity. Buy snorkel and mask for your child. Pour the vinegar into a tub and leave your child submerged for four to seven hours. <laughs> you must hold your head, child's head so that the hair remains under vinegar and the end of the snorkel above vinegar. If your wife is back from Tampa, which she probably won't be, you can exchange head-holding duties with her on the hour. Your child will become a pickle for a few days. <laughs> there is an alternative method for getting rid of lice. Rather than the burn your home and then the tub treatment, you examine each hair on your child's head with the Hubble telescope fitted with a special lice attachment on the far end. You will see that the egg of a louse looks like a teeny tiny drop of water. Remove it with a blowtorch. <laughs> you protect your child's head with a thick coating of axle grease and non-flammable mayonnaise prior to blowtorching. So far we've not mentioned the actual lice themselves. We've not discussed what a louse looks like and how to kill it. I'm forbidden to do that, to do either, because my lawyer is now in negotiation with two of them at an undisclosed location. <laughs> Uh, we have birthday parties, family visits, uh, food, holiday shopping, sports, kids, journals, and so on and so forth, down to the, another section four, and then finally the very end, uh, which is called the vasectomy. <laughs> <laughs> now, I would say this about the birthday parties. Uh, some, some parents... Uh, I, I have two, two examples of birthday parties in the book. I've seen this happen. It's, some parents seem to they will invite like 50 children. They will rent a state park. <laughs> they will uh, get an ice cream truck, not just for the children to, to buy ice cream, but for the children to drive around after they eat all the ice cream. It's just amazing what some parents will do. Uh, I think it's less so up, up in the mountains. I think it's more down in the, in the Piedmont. When it's not, nice, it's that. But I came, I came across this, across this idea uh, that work, and, and you know, we're talking like $7,000, something like this. I came across a great idea, and it was this. My son was having, my, my nine-year-old was having his birthday, and I got three of his buddies to come to, to, to my house, our house, at 7 o'clock before school and go to a place that's sort of like, uh, that they really like. It's called Goody, Goodies, but it's like a, a Waffle House, you know, one of these little diners. And the, the four of them went in, I gave them a table, set them down, and I went over to the, to the breakfast bar and read the newspaper and drank coffee, let them order and talk. And I read the newspaper, drank coffee, ate my own breakfast, and let them have a good time, and the total cost was, I think, $27. <laughs> and my son had more fun doing that than, than that he, I, whatever, I think if I go to Anyway, that's in the book, and uh, so that's, uh, that's all I have planned, but I, I'm certainly willing to answer any questions. We're, the time is moving on, and uh, but I'll be happy to answer any questions any of you have about anything. I've covered a few things that I'm happy I could cover, and I just appreciate y'all showing up. Yes, ma'am. From, not from a legal point of view, or, but from an artistic point of view, 
how difficult is it for you to relinquish your your baby, your creation, to an adaptation or something uh, you know, for movie or stage? Um, it, so far, I've been very fortunate in the few cases. Uh, actually, I was less fortunate in, in one. Uh, Rainy, my first book was made into a movie, which is which has never been seen. As far as I, <laughs> I saw about 40 minutes of it, and with the exception of some really good acting, I could kind of understand why it's never been seen. Uh, but that kind of got out of my hands, and, and I didn't know what was going on. But on, on, on all other cases, there haven't been that many, but uh, for example, Kathy said, I want you to look through the script. So she would, she sent me the, an early draft, and I looked through, and I had a few very minor, idea, minor ideas about, uh, I don't know, just a word or two here and there, but it was wonderful. And so I've been very fortunate. I'm, I'm, I'm sure that I could uh, I run into to some some bad luck, but so far I haven't, and it's it's not because I haven't wasn't interested in adapting it myself. Uh, it, it didn't bother me, of course, for someone else to do it. In fact, I was very happy to for someone else to do it. <coughs> Honored that someone would, would would want to do it. Any other questions? <coughs> yes, yes, sir. How do you divide your time between teaching and writing? How the, the, which do you enjoy most? The question is, how do I divide my time between uh, writing and teaching, and which do I jo enjoy most? Um, it's kind of a problem. I, I, I go sort of in fits and starts on the writing. R right now, I'm very busy teaching, and so I tend to spend most of my time teaching. I, I'll piddle around with something, but when summer comes, I'll be writing every morning regularly, straight through, getting up early. So it's kind of one and the other, rather than both at the same time is the way it works out. And, uh, you know, each has its uh, moments that, that are, are, are um, uns unsurpassable. With teaching, you know, you, there is no ceiling. If you have one student, you can, tend, you can spend all your time teaching. And, and so if you have two students, you can spend all your time teaching. So teachers are, are it's unbelievable to, to pull back to do anything else, and it's hard. And you have to harden yourself a little bit because you can't spend all that time. Do you teach writing? I teach uh, creative writing, that, that's what, and, and so that's, uh, and then the writing, you know, you want, you need to be selfish and alone when you write, and so when you have characters who are acting on their own, uh, in a way, that can be terribly exciting, and it can be exciting when, when students make breakthroughs that you feel they may not have made through, or they may, but they would have made later. We t I teach in an MFA program, we have uh, graduate students for three years, uh, working in poetry, nonfiction, and creative. <laughs> Uh, writing, I mean fiction, nonfiction, creative nonfiction, or poetry, and uh, during that three years, they're expected to produce a, a book. And uh, my feeling is that during those three years, they may not learn much more than they would during a normal six or eight year period. But, but I think we can help them cut corners in, in, in the craft of writing. Yes. You answered the question in that phase. Oh, right. You don't teach any undergraduates. Right. I do teach undergraduates. We have an under, undergraduates also, and we have a BFA uh, program also. So we have both undergraduates and graduates who are working on writing degrees. Yes, sir. Cloud, I enjoyed your gospel rendition of Walking Across Egypt. In fact, it sounded like you had an entire choir behind you. <laughs> but if, and I know you've been hanging with those Watson boys down at Chapel Hill singing. But if I got in your car and it was just you and me, and none of the King cousins were in there, and we rode down the road together, who would we be listening to? <coughs> would you be singing, or would you have a CD that? Uh... Uh, we'd be listening to. Uh, um, we, we might be listening to some of the. We'd be listening to some good mountain music, probably. Uh, Bluegrass Ralph, Ralph Stanley. Mm -hmm. uh, that reminds me of a little something I have right here. I'd love to play for y'all. It's uh, uh, we might listen to a little bit of James Brown also. And uh, when I wrote my my last book, The Night Train, uh, I came across uh, an interview with James Brown. It, 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 when I, in 1963, I played with a group of uh, six other white boys, and one of them wanted to be James Brown. And he, he, he did the whole thing. Uh, he did the cape. He came out on the stage and uh, fell down and singing, please, please, please. And we, we in fact, he, he the, one of the, the, what started me on the novel was he, he came out where, this is, this is probably 1963, the album uh, uh, Live at the Apollo had just come out, 35 minutes, 11 songs, back to back, no breaks, we're just playing on black and white radio stations as if it were one song. He comes out, we're all standing up there, it's a, it's a, it's a club. Nightclub, he falls down on the stage in the middle of the song singing, please, please, and he goes, please, he's down, lying down, holding on his elbow, he says, please, please, and the band is supposed to go, dum, 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 
And she goes, please, please. And we just stood there. <laughs> <laughs> we just stood there looking at him. <laughs> and his eyes got big. He said, please. <laughs> <laughs> finally, don't, don't, don't. We finally came in. Now, uh, what I, so, so I, I've been, uh, very interested in James Brown. Now, the, Michael Tilson Thomas, who directs the San Francisco Symphony Orchestra in 1963, studying Stravinsky, hears for the first time on his car radio James Brown. The syncopation of the, the, the sophisticated syncopation. He's so overcome, he pulls off the side of the road to listen. I have an interview. I'm not going to play the interview, but it's an hour interview. It's a wonderful interview, Michael, the MTT series number seven. It's an hour interview, Michael Tilson Thomas, 2006, with James Brown. And in the middle of the interview, Michael Tilson Thomas is so excited. He said, "I was driving along, and I just, I, I, I heard your song for the first time. I heard your music for the first time, and I had to pull over to the side of the road." And you hear James Brown in the background go, "That was the right thing to do." <laughs> <laughs> and then Michael Tilson Thomas plays. This 30 second clip that I'm about to play you of Stravinsky, and you will hear who he's collaging Stravinsky with. I hope I've got this right. And when I heard this, well, let me go ahead and play it. together. It's an amazing piece of music, and uh, I got inspired uh, by a lot of things related to that particular time and wrote uh, books. So I, you know, I would be singing uh, any number of things. I might have some, uh, some uh, Mose Allison, some uh, Wes Montgomery, some... Uh, I would enjoy a ride down the road. <laughs> any other questions? I don't want to hold y'all up. Thank you so much for coming out. I'd be happy to sign a book.